Hello, welcome to um, my talk. Basically, I hope you had a lovely afternoon and you are still uh, refreshed and you had enough coffee because during this session we'll talk about some techniques to, to basically optimize the, the startup performance of the, your JVM. So it's not as, as easy as possible topic. I hope you won't get so tired after this. And you still attend the, the, the keynote because after my talk it's the, the uh, keynote. Okay, so um, welcome. My name is Jonas Valoshin. Um, the agenda for today is quite packed. Uh, nevertheless, we will talk about three main topics. Uh, the, the important point before jumping into these three main topics is actually to understand when does the JVM startup matters for your application? Because I can tell you it's not basically mandatory to improve it in all the situations. And after this briefing, basically we will um, try to assess three different techniques. One comes from Hotspot. Who uses Hotspot? Oh, only two, three? Yeah, so but, but I assume because if uh, uh, the others are using either OpenG9, other GraalVM, are probably other uh, <laughs> flavors of the, the hotspot GDK or OpenGDK. Uh, anyway, so um, I will focus on three main areas. I will uh, tell you what are possible options depending on the, the JVM that you, you run on production, how you can basically optimize the performance, the startup performance. Uh, a few things about myself, uh, I wouldn't spend too much time on this. I'm a software architect, I work in Vienna for RBI, Raiffeisen Bank International, and besides this, basically, I do uh, as much I can afford in my spare time some, some training, so basically, if you want one of these, get in touch with me. That's the idea of this slide. Okie dokie. Um, let's start with the first uh, brief introduction. When this JVM startup matters for you? Because it's not always, um, I would say, um, uh, you don't feel it most of the cases. Um, but in, at least in my experience, I felt so much in so-called function as a service, which, is, which are part of serverless. Basically, serverless is a broader concept. It's based on backend as a service, function as a service. And function as a service are so, you create a small package using a CDK that cloud provides you a CDK. It's basically an API. You implement one interface, for example. You package it, and you don't care, basically, when it runs, uh, where it runs. And when it runs, you can define some triggers. For example, if you use AWS, you upload the file in S3 bucket or something, and you can define uh, an event. And the problem with this is it starts when it's triggered. So basically, the JVM starts in that moment. And of course, you don't want to have a higher latency. Right, You want to be as fast as possible, especially if you are on critical path with this. And the problem is, of how, or the question is, how I can diminish the call startup time? Is this startup time uh, from the moment that you kick off the JVM until you, you get the first successful request from, from your, for example, Lambda? And of course, it does the job and it dies. And this is a very good also optimization cost because if you have, for example, less frequent um, cases of um, processes, it's much more efficient to, to create such sort of lambdas and not to have a long running job. So basically in production, it's always good to have a mixture of these. Uh, so this is one particular case. Uh, the other cases might be for CLI applications. For example, if you have a short application, you code it in Java, why not? And you want to, to start as, as fast as possible. And in such cases, maybe this matters the most. In others, it's questionable, right? Uh, if you have, for example, a microservices architecture, maybe you even not notice it, right? 
maybe. But in these particular examples that I gave you, uh, I would say it really a po it's a point of interest. Uh, of course, the benefits is because I mentioned about cloud, um, it's cost optimizations, and sometimes it's also important because you want a quick feedback loop in your deployment cycles, right? For example, you deploy in, in uh, development or SIT or UAT or whatever, and you want to, to, to start that service as fast as possible. Maybe in production you deploy less often. In these cases, this matters. Uh, I would like to have a very clear understanding because in the current presentation I refer mainly to the cold startup time. There are different types of startup times, of, of, of uh, different, three, three different categories. Cold startup means from the moment when you trigger the JVM until it fulfills your for request, first request. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it, the JVM itself reaches steady state, right? Because it just started. Uh, on, the, on the other side is this hot startup. Uh, you can have hot startup, for example, if you have some process already in a steady state in, in the memory and uh, you transit from a background to a foreground, right? So it transits from background to foreground, or for example, if you compile natively, right? Like C, C++, what also with GraphVM. And this starts, uh, this has a hot startup because everything it's, it's already compiled with the, the ahead of time optimizations, for example. And in the middle, of course, you have this warm startup. It's basically, uh, if you run in, in just-in-time compilation or with JIT enabled, uh, you spend some time until you reach this steady state of the JVM. Basically, uh, you want to, to uh, warm up sufficiently enough to trigger some method compilation, to load enough classes, and so on. So this is basically a bit uh, to be on the same page with this terminology. And further on, uh, if, you, if I have basically to have an overview about the current optimizations techniques that potentially could improve your JVM, called startup time, uh, at the moment there are quite few alternatives every has pros and cons. None is the, the ideal way, depends very much on how you use it and in which context. Nevertheless, today I'll be focused on the top three. Uh, in the morning, there was a presentation about Crack, if you attended, yes. Uh, Crack uses uh, Linux Crew, if you have heard. So basically, um, what means, uh, what is this Linux Crew? A Linux Crew has the um, option basically to freeze a running process, it saves it, Right, and then you, uh, it does a snapshot, it saves it, and then you can restore it later on. And of course, if you restore it later on, it's much faster because you, you basically don't have that cold startup time. The f and of course, because Li uh, Crack uses Linux Crew, it's implicitly bound to Linux. You cannot use it. And at the moment, Crack is still under development, so it's not production ready. But at least I saw some, some use cases and it looks quite promising. And of course, there is this laden initiatives. Uh, Alibaba Dragon, well, we, I, I've, we don't quite use it, but it has uh, one um, technology which is called JWarmup. You can do more or less the same things. Or if you go into these commercial JVMs, Ready Now has this feature for some time already. But nevertheless, for today, the, the main um, the main focus is the top three ones. Let's see how, what it is about. First one is, uh, some people call it just CDS. It's, it's okay. But I will tell you what is the difference because basically there are three flavors. It's CDS, App CDS, and Dynamic CDS. And I will tell you a bit of the history, how, how, how it evolved, what are the limitations, and how you can use it. Good, <clears throat> so CDS basically, what it is, it's, it's there since um, uh, Sun 1.5, if you, if you yeah, Sun JDK 1.5. It's, it's there since uh, a while. What it does, basically CDS, it's just an archive. And this archive, it's stored on the file system. 
and inside this archive, it contains already pre-processed metadata. What is this? It's mainly bytecode that was already loaded, was already verified, and it was already mapped in Metaspace or PermGen in the older um, versions. And the idea is if I have to restore this archive on a subsequent JVM runs, of course, it's much faster than read it from the disk, do the, the verif apply the verifier, and so on and so forth. So it's much faster to just take a snapshot, save it, and on a subsequent run, map it to a, in, uh, to a specific virtual address, and on a subsequent run, just reuse it. And this is the idea of the CDS. Uh, at the moment, um, in the latest JDKs, uh, it contains around 1,300 classes. And this is, by the way, limited to only core classes. So it's the, those classes that are part of the JDK, right? And those classes that are most commonly used. For example, Java, there are classes from Java IO, Java Neo, and so on. And only these classes, uh, these are... Um, loaded by the bootstrap class loader, which is basically the parent class loader. And starting with um, a version, a JDK version 12, you have this archive before, prior 12, it was not implicitly generated, but starting with uh, JDK 12, it's implicitly dumped in the moment when you install the JDK. So you then, and it's, it's auto-enabled, so you don't notice it anyway, but it is there. Um, and as, as said, um, it contains only these classes. If you have to disable it, just to give you an understanding, it probably decreases the startup time with between 100 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. It's not a lot, if you ask me. And because of this, uh, starting JDK 12, uh, sorry, 10, J in OpenJDK 10, they introduce AppCDS which basically extends the concept of, of CDS because what was the more or less limitation with CDS? It's just core classes, and it, it doesn't contain, for example, application class loader or custom class loaders. And of course, in, in the modern applications, you have huge, huge uh, dependencies. And all of these are either uh, loaded with the application class loader, but for example, Spring has a really a lot of custom class loaders. And of course, this is not uh, enough. And uh, AppCDS extends these concepts to cover more classes for the class part, the ones that I already mentioned. In AppCDS, basically, uh, the AppCDA is still one package, it's one archive, and it includes also the, the CDS, the default CDS. So if you have AppCDS generated explicitly, and you have to generate this explicitly, it includes also the core classes. Uh, what I really don't, I mean, what I consider a bit of, of uh, impediment with AppCDS uh, one, one of these is basically the way how you generate it because it's a three-step three procedure. First, you have to create a list with all potential classes that might be included. In the second run of the GVM, you basically create the archive, and in the third run, you use the archive. So it's, I would say it's a bit cumbersome, if you ask me. Uh, one more point to mention, the, the footprint of this archive, it's bigger, don't, don't compare with the normal jar. It's not a normal jar, it's probably three to five times bigger than a normal jar because it has a, a specific internal format, that format that should be implicitly uh, mapped and reused. And this is uh, something that you should consider. Uh, then, uh, starting JDK 13, uh, they uh, introduced dynamic CDS, and Dynamics CDS covers the same, uh, I mean, both application and custom. The thing is, it simplifies a bit the creation process. So you don't need three-step procedure, like in AppCDS, but you can do it with two steps. First step, start the JVM, set the flag, and then if the JVM, you, you can also do it during the runtime, but uh, by default, it's generated when you send control C signal to the JVM, or in, in other words, you know, when you successfully cl uh, close the JVM, it's generated, 
And then in a subsequent run, so this is the first step, and in a subsequent run, uh, you can reuse it. Uh, and I will show you. I have also demos. I will show you uh, how you can do that in practice. One of the key points in regards to FCDS, it has a slightly different approach in the sense that, and it's better to switch my slide, with dynamic CDS, there is a layering approach. Like a dynamic CDS is basically a top layer archive which contains some classes, but they depend on a base layer archive. And in such a case, the base layer archive could be the default CDS archive, which was generated with when you uh, installed the JDK. So basically, when, if you generate a dynamic CDS archive, it doesn't contain the, the system core classes. App CDS does it. Dynamic CDS do not, does not contain those. They are basically, it's this layering approach. You can uh, also go a bit into um, customizations. You can create a base layer archive as an application, CDS, and then top layer could be a dynamic one. Uh, I didn't find this in practice, uh, but you can potentially do it. For example, if you have in the base layer archive that the most common classes that you use, uh, like dump as an app CDS and on top basically just the different flavors that each application might, might be um, particular to. But again, uh, it, it, it's, it gives you a bit of flexibility. You can also chain these archives. Uh, very basically, you can say static archive, dynamic archive, depending on the Linux. There is this delimitator and so on. Uh, all in all, um, this, most of the things I already mentioned, what I want to emphasize in this slide, um, here what I did, I, I just collected what I considered as being a bit of much interest. Of course, there were a lot of enhancements slash bugs uh, in regards to CDS, App CDS, Dynamic CDS, from the beginning to this 19, the, the la last version. What I think it's important to understand is also the idea that Newer JVM you use, uh, better performance you get. Because, for example, if you look only in the 15, they included these dynamically uh, generated classes. Uh, sorry, uh, they included these Lambda proxy classes in the CDS archive. What's a Lambda uh, proxy class? is basically uh, when you write lambdas, and we all write lambdas, this generates implicitly when you start the JD, J, uh, when you start the JVM, they generate on the flight classes. And these classes are due to the lambdas that you wrote. And prior 15, they, these were not included, and of course, um, because uh, modern frameworks and modern style of, of writing code have a lot of this, uh, you, you can also improve uh, quite significantly. And of course, this was, um, if you have heard about um, uh, G, uh, ZGC, of course, it has uh, support and so on. Um, if you have to, this is a bit of really in detail slide. Uh, I wouldn't uh, stay too much on it because it's really about internals. If you are curious, the CDS archive has seven regions in total, some from Metaspace, some from HIP. Uh, what is basically important to mention in this slide is, the thing is, when you generate the archive, it's mapped implicitly at the, at the fixed virtual address. And this address is this one, 800 million in hexa. The problem is, or what, my, what problem might occur, because all the, uh, there was a kernel patch initially for Linux, and then it was ported, uh, it was also for one for Windows, which, is, um, which fixes this problem that might occur if on each individual run, you map the virtual ad you you map the, the process space at the same virtual addresses as base addresses, and this is a threat because if a, if if you map it always on consequent runs at the fixed address, basically it's a security threat, and that's why this ASLR uh, randomizes on the subsequent run to, to not start with the same previous address. And it's totally random, of course, in, in one range. And because of this, it might impact this fixed address, right? It's 
because it, it might collapse with that one. And uh, you also have to take care of this. Um, maybe you have to disable it, maybe. Uh, I'm not uh, suggesting that to do, at least in production. But uh, you have to also be careful with this scenario. But if you don't like this address, there is a flag which is called shared base class address, where you can, for example, set a specific one, or you say zero, and this is randomly generated each time. So you have this, this option. All in all, that's basically it. I would like to demo, and I would like to give you a, a taste of how it works and how much you can improve. And for this, I will switch, basically, um, to I, I choose for this demo, I choose a, the SpringPad Clinic application. And the SpringPad Clinic application, you already, most of you already know. And everything that I'm doing, it's anyway public. I will follow step by step some guidelines that I published on, on GitHub because it's, it's much easier for me. Uh, for example, uh, this has information about how you do it step by step for app and dynamic CDS. So I'll jump to directly dynamic CDS. And I will use this spet, uh, Spring Pet Clinic. Uh, application. Let me just switch to that folder, basically. I'm, I'm very lazy. I'll copy-paste everything. It makes myself also comfortable. I don't like to write too much. Uh, okay, so first of all, just to be sure, I will enable um, OpenGDK 19 because it's the, the last one. And of course, it might uh, be the, the best or the most appropriate for this demo. So it's enabled. Uh, Java Home was set to that one. I have to compile it just for the, the sake of this demo. I have it already compiled, but this is a um, compilation phase. I disabled the, the test. I really don't care about the test. I just care about the, the generated jars. And then, what is the first step when you want to uh, generate a dynamic CDSR hive? Is basically this flag that you tell the JVM, OK, um, the dynamic CDS, I want to generate this archive, and I want you to, to give that archive uh, this name. Of course, uh, server port is implicit. You can skip it, but I will just keep it because later on I have more JVM, so that's why, just to be consistent, I will use it all, always. So now I'm just starting the spin, uh, spring pet cleaning application. And there is one important point, and I also saw people making this mistake. Don't immediately stop the JVM. Why? You, you can have it also if you send the control C signal to the JVM. What's the problem? Or what, what would be a potential uh, um, issue with this? The thing is, because classes are lazy loaded, you don't have probably sufficient classes loaded in Metaspace, in memory. And of course, you can create a CDSR hive with less classes that you might use in a real scenario. And that's why always uh, do what I'm doing here. Open your application and try to basically call as much as possible, be as, as comprehensive as possible to hit more endpoints. And this I would do. Basically, I will jump from one to the other, and I will try to access different functionalities, hoping that I'm triggering different endpoints, hoping that those different endpoints will load more and more classes. That's the whole point. I update the owner. What are func other functionalities? Yeah, maybe let's add my lovely pet here, 10, 10, 20, 20, 22. Uh, this is not the wrong. 22, I don't care if it is a bird. Uh, add a pet, I can also edit this. I updated this, I add a visit, and uh, more or less that's it. Then if I have to add the owner, maybe Martin, maybe Mosterman, maybe Voxet, maybe Cluj, and the phone number, it really doesn't matter. And more or less that's it. Now, okay, let's suppose, ignore this exception. <laughs> it, it's spring, so you should get used to these exceptions, especially during startup time. You, you see a lot if you profile. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so now uh, you are in the phase where you trigger more and more endpoints, and now I'm just pressing Control C, and you can see here, 
you get a slightly confusing message. It says, warning, CDS, skipping, blah, blah, blah. The problem is not all the classes that are uh, actually loaded in Metaspace could be included in the CDSL Hive because still some classes are a bit older. They were linked, but they were verified with an older verifier. And they cannot be included. But maybe what was already included, it was enough. And then let's see if I have my dynamic CDS. Voila, it's here. And the timestamp is 1616. So it's exactly uh, this, this, this time. And I have it created. So this is the first phase. And the second phase is just to uh, start the, the JVM, basically, and enabling it and the thing, how it is, let me clear again. Uh, it's basically now I'm telling, hey, use this shared archive previously created. This is optional, it's just for you, and I would advise you to do this because otherwise if you screw up something, the JVM doesn't tell you CDSR Hive was not in, uh, created or it was not properly loaded. And you might think, okay, I have the CDSR Hive and it's used, but in reality it was not because it might happen. And this is why, at least as a smoke test, you have to, at, at least this is how I do, I just start the JVM and then I read this few lines and says, okay, because it was a dynamic G uh, CDSR Hive, it loaded the... the CDS, the base one, the default one, and then it loaded mine, which I created explicitly, right? So in this case, I'm pretty sure that, okay, it, it worked. And then I don't care about, by, uh, for me personally, I really don't care how many seconds it says there, because what I'll do now, I'll try to understand uh, how much uh, uh, speed time I improved, and I will show you how I do that. Um, basically, I will, uh, if, you, if you want, always have a baseline or a vanilla uh, test case where you start one by default, and this is a bit of longer uh, command line. It says, I'm ready ranking standard output to dev null. I don't care about what it is there because I want to um, to not uh, miss the, the things that I, I'm interested in. So all the logs, everything from, from standard output are redirected to def null. And then I'm using this uh, small script, time to first response to measure my response time. And this is how I do usually. Because I'm, I'm not relying uh, on the message that, that the spring prints started in five minutes because it's not fully, it's not actually functional. Uh, some bins are lazily loaded and basically you, uh, you, you need to trigger the first real request and this is basically my measurement. And this is how I'm doing this script basically does a curl, curl. Uh, it's a get endpoint actually and it tries to, to cycle, it waits uh, 100 nanoseconds and uh, uh, yeah, 100 nanoseconds and then uh, when the status is 200, it stops. And this is the way how I measure this. And if I start this, again, because it's the standard output is redirected to dev null, I don't see any uh, Spring Boot log here. And voila, this is the, the how it starts. Uh, and you can see this is seven uh, seconds. And if you write the startup application, it's probably four. But that one, it's really not of interest for me. And if you do like such uh, performance tests, uh, don't rely on these uh, frameworks, what they tell you. Do it by yourself and try it by yourself. Uh, this was one test and basically I have to, yeah, just for the sake of, of comparison, I open a second instance. You see here different port. Ah, sorry, sorry, I messed it up. Um, I jumped to the, this was the second one without the, the, um, the CDS enabled, which was on port 8081. Um, and yeah, around seven seconds. So basically this is the total cold startup time, is the time when I, I started the application until I received the first request. 
And now, so this is the vanilla test for me. This is a baseline. Without the baseline, I cannot measure the, the, the CDS improvement, if it is faster or not. And what I'm doing now, sorry, I always sh uh, shift back to the wrong window. Now I'm trying to create one test case by explicitly telling the JVM, please use, for example, dynamic CDS. And of course, I choose a different port just to make sure they don't crash. Clash. And let's see, in this case, from seven, sev seven, yeah, how, how far, yeah, it decreased to six, for example. Maybe not, not a lot, I would say. And then let's have a second test with CDS, with dynamic CDS. Uh, no, something it's wrong. Yeah, let's uh, do so, yeah. because I already started it on this port. Okay, and now I'll do it again. Port 8083. Yeah, demos are always challenging. I you always mess up something. Uh, Okay, so basically with dynamic CDS, it didn't reduce too much, right? From seven in a nutshell to six, one second. Does it matter to you? I don't know, maybe no, <laughs> maybe yes, <laughs> but it's, it's not promising. Uh, uh, this morning, basically, I, I, <laughs> uh, my dynamic CDS tests were a bit much perform, uh, faster in the sense that they were 5.9, closer to 6. But yeah, during the demo, it was 6 plus. Uh, all in all, maybe it's not a lot of improvements uh, with even dynamic CDS. In reality, on average, it doesn't reduce more than 20 percentage of your time, the startup time. So it's probably the, the fastest, it's 25 less. Um, the problem or the limitation with this, there are a lot of, corn, or a lot of constraints around CDS. Uh, maybe this is why it's not used, uh, so, so used in production. I even haven't asked you, have you used this CDS? No. Somebody uses it? Nobody, okay. Uh, maybe it explains why. Uh, there are a lot of uh, limitations with this. First of all, uh, if you create the CDS archive on one platform, it's not reusable, so you cannot take it from Linux to Windows. It's not like a jar as mentioned. The, uh, the second uh, case is, for example, if you create the CDS archive with one class path, because you, you, uh, you saw how I did it. And then you move it to production and you change the class path in the sense that you remove some jars, it's disabled, it doesn't work. So the constraint is the class path that is present at the time when you generate the CDS archive should be the same or a prefix of the class path that you run in production, which means you cannot generate it on your test environment because there might, you might have some tests library, right? And in production, you don't have those. And this is um, actually one very important caveat about this. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so this is about a hotspot. Uh, it was continuously improved, um, but still, um, it's, it's, yeah, there is a lot of, of uh, uh, things to, to still further improve. And yeah, maybe one more important one which I didn't mention, this is not forward compatible in the sense that if you create it with uh, JDK uh, 17, for, uh, 16, sorry, if you run it with 17, it doesn't work. Starting with 18, there was a fix. So if you run it with an older JDK, the CDS archive, it's, uh, it, it's dynamically regenerated. But before 18, this didn't work. So it has quite a lot of, of limitations, I would say. Now let's jump in the second uh, case, and I will tell you a few things about Eclipse OpenGNI. Uh, hey, um, have you heard about OpenGNI, the, the JVM itself? It's basically the former IBM, has really nothing in common. There is no connection between hotspot in terms of source code and IBM J9, uh, they, they both implement the, the standard, but they are different implementations. So the internal are totally different. And this is basically, now it's called Eclipse Open G9. And it basically has this feature, shared class, class cache. 
And it's the same idea, but in addition, they also stored just-in-time compiled code. So it's that code which dynamically is generated and it's stored, and on the subsequent execution, it's seen as AOT, but is not AOT from Graal, for example. And of course, this, this has a bit of advantage because it, it's a mixture between uh, compile code and basically the, the metadata which is stored. There is also some, some uh, caveats about this custom class loader. So implicitly, if the class is loaded by a custom class loader, if that one doesn't extend this URL class loader, they are not included. But you can basically circumvent that with some helper APIs. In terms of, of structure, it has a, because I mentioned it's a different implementation, it's a slightly different structure. Uh, the way how OpenJ9 uh, splits the, the class itself, it's in two sections, I would say, ROM and RAM. In the ROM, it's the, uh, the ROM class, it's basically the one which is shared. And RAM class, it's basically the one which is initiated inside each JVM instance. And ROM class, it's, it's also called immutable, and it, what it contains, pointers to interfaces, subclasses, inner classes, and so on. And yeah, in this CDSR hive are only these ROM classes, and profile data, of course, compile code, of course, some information, these chain classes are useful for the, the compiler itself to detect if the same version of the method was compiled. All in all, this is the, the high-level structure, and I will show you how it works. I'm using the same, I will use the same, basically, application. I will just switch back to a different section, and this section is the second one, which is called share class cache. And here, it's a bit simpler because you don't need a lot of steps. It's generated um, in, with less effort. And for this to work, I have to enable uh, OpenJ9 is this one, S18. I have some, some uh, key codes here. And you can see this was enabled, so the, my Java home is set to this Eclipse, uh, Eclipse OpenJ9. Now I'm just clear. Um, maybe for the sake of, of consistency, I'll try to rebuild the, the, um, the jars. It's not necessary. And then what? let's explain a bit the, the command line uh, to um, tell the JVM, I want the CDS to be enabled. You have to, spe to uh, set the name for it and uh, the directory. There are also some other flags that I've used. This is like a soft limit and a hard limit. And this is a quick start, which I'm using here. I'm trying to cheat a bit. Quick start is basically a particular uh, flag, which is only meant to be used for improving the startup time. But if you use a long running application and you set the quick startup, you might not have the same performance in a long running application on top of G9 because this is particularly tailored meant to improve the startup time because it disables other compiler optimizations. And this is basically what I will use here. I will, it was uh, compiled and now I will start the, the, JV, the, the spin pack clinic by using OpenJ9, and the same idea. I get back to the application, I just browse to the endpoints. Yeah, it was there. Uh, I just browse to the endpoints, I want to find an owner, why not let's edit an owner. Again, it's exactly what I did on the previous use case, the same rational. I want to trigger more and more endpoints, hoping that more and more classes will be loaded. Maybe let's add a, a pet. Why not? Let's put 10, 10, 2022. Uh, let's add a visit, All right? My pet visit, and so on. Uh, if I have to add an owner, I'll probably do the same. Martin Musterman, Voxed, Cluj, and this telephone number. Veterinarians, uh, this I didn't use last time, but yeah, he's just an endpoint. I hope it doesn't matter too much. And now I'm, I'm. Um, uh, shutting down the JVM, and I will show you what was generated, ls minus all, 
And the archive itself is this one. Uh, it's the timestamp corresponds to this one. It's 1630. And yeah, the, the full uh, file name is slightly different, but you can see inside is this SCC, the flag that I, I explicitly specified here. If you, uh, yeah, this one. And now what I'm trying to do is some tests, uh, how much improvement I've got. Let's clear this and uh, what I will do. First run, of course, I have to, I will start again the JVM. It's exactly the same command because uh, OpenG9 doesn't need to start it with a set of flags and then uh, reuse it later with a different set of flags. So I'll just start it with uh, telling I want this to be reused. And voila, it basically decreased to 4.4. I didn't change the line of code, just tweaking a bit the, the JVM uh, arguments. And then I'll do a second test. This is a, a second instance which was started on port 8081, so it's 4.2, right? How much was before? How faster was it before with hotspot? Do you recall? Yes, so 6 was the fastest and here it's 4.5. I would say it matters, right? Because you really didn't change anything in the application. You, you basically decrease, of course, in this case with three seconds, but you cannot generalize this, without doing anything, just playing with flags and just switching with JVMs. And maybe this matters. This, this becomes to be a bit of, of interest for you, so you can potentially look further into. Um, also, my experience is, is that it does a better job in comparison to the to, to, to hotspot, to, to be honest, and it's also highly customizable with a lot of flags. Um, so you might want to have a look if you want. Uh, it's, it's promising, yeah. Uh, but still, the question is, does it really matter or is it sufficient enough for you? Uh, if not, uh, if you run on Linux, try crack the OpenJDK new initiative that, for example, you had the presentation in the morning, or switch to some native uh, compilation, or change the language. Don't use Java at all, right? Use something else, which doesn't need a JVM. It's possible. You just have to use the right tool. Uh, but in such a case, let's suppose you like it so much, but you want to play around, uh, GraalVM, uh, Oh, with GraalVM native image, because GraalVM is, is very generic. With GraalVM native image, you can compile, and during compilation or the output of the compilation phase, you generate the, the binary. And this binary starts like very fast because it's already um, it's it's binary, right? And how it works? Uh, how this generates this binary during the build time, basically? The application, of course, it's configured, and parts of this application, it's run until all the possible paths are discovered, because it's an ahead-of-time compilation, and you have to compile as much as you can discover ahead of time. If you cannot discover something, that part of the code is not com included in, in, the, in the code. And how would you do that? You may ask yourself, yes, but I'm using reflection. I'm using a lot of runtime techniques which are not available during compile time because basically compilation phase, it's, it's a static phase. And for this, uh, reflection is not a problem at all. It becomes very trivial. You have to complement to tell this process with some uh, configuration files with all the dependencies that you might potentially use. Otherwise, if you don't do it properly, even if you try to create a native image, a, a binary, it falls back to the default one. And uh, this is more or less the, the um, process. Uh, if you want to go a bit deeper, I think Graal uh, itself, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a project which is worth it to, to, to read at least a few ideas about it, because it does really a lot of innovations in this field. 
And at uh, the bottom of this slide, there is this paper. So if you are interested in this overall process, uh, it's better explained that I could have done in this paper. Now let's um, try to um, basically give you a clue or a grasp how much time you can improve with this startup time uh, if, you, if you compile it natively. Have you used this uh, Graal native image? Nobody? Uh, one more point to make, if I have to choose my project from Spring uh, Pet Clinic, I have to choose to a different implementation which uses the native uh, extensions. Because the problem is you cannot easily take your project, sorry, uh, you cannot easily take your project and try to compile it natively with uh, GraalVM. Uh, you need to, to use specific native extensions and for example, uh, more, all, all the, the, the biggest uh, frameworks, including also Spring, they have these native extensions. So you want to be focused on native compilation and you, you have to use native extensions from the very beginning. Otherwise, you will probably not succeed. And this I tried and I spent a lot of time and I give, gave up because it, it, it's very difficult to take your own your project. You, you did it with, with Hotspot, it ran in, in just-in-time uh, fashion, and now you, have, you want to compile it, for example, with Graal, and suddenly you succeed. It's uh, very tough, and that's why I'm switching it to uh, Spring Native. Spring Native, it's uh, here. But again, this is just for the Spring, also Quarkus, depending on, on the framework, you, you have these native extensions. And in here, um, of course, because it has to compile ahead of time, the compilation phase is longer. Uh, sorry, the build time is longer. Uh, just to give you a hint, it could take one, two minutes in comparison to probably 20 seconds, how it is uh, if you generate the jars. It's longer because it has to, to discover everything and compile what was discovered, and it stops there. And it's so-called, in, in, in theory, closed-world optimizations because it compiles only what it could discover. And this is the, the idea. I won't do this compilation now because I want to save some time, so, um, probably around one plus minutes. And I will jump directly into the folder where I have already the binary. And the binary is called pet, uh, pet clinic uh, dash JPA. So it's analogous to the, to the previous one. Uh, that one was used also JPA. And now if I want to run it, so this is basically the binary. It already st uh, stopped because it was like how much? 85 milliseconds, right? It's less than one second because it's native. It starts very quickly. And if I go again, uh, I did something wrong. Yeah, 22 milliseconds. Of course, you cannot even beat this, right? Before was four, the best one, but now it's, it's not even 100, right? Of course, it's, it's something uh, from, from a different league. Uh, league. So, this could help you. Um, by the way, I don't want to give you the idea that you should use GraalVM for long-running applications, right? This is a totally different topic. If you want to just improve the startup time, look on this. So I was referring just on the startup time. Long-running, totally different story, different talk. Maybe we can have next year. <laughs> because there, there is a different set of problems with that one. So I won't, uh, don't, don't mix the things. I was referring just for the startup timing is demo. Um, here are the timings that you already show. Um, again, I mentioned for you, if you want to use these frameworks, you, uh, you, have to, to have, you need to have the extensions for them. And if you want uh, a bit deeper, there, of course, uh, comes with a bunch of limitations, and if you want to see these different limitations, you have, depending on, on your Graal VM native image version, there is a, not all, but some of them have, have these slash limitations where you can read. In a nutshell, 
uh, it's not supporting this, um, for example, implicitly invoke dynamic or security manager might have a problem. Some features might operate di differently with um, uh, native execution. And for example, if something gets screwed up, it falls back to the default hotspot VM. So if you, for example, try native compilation and there are some things that doesn't work, it falls back to the, to the traditional Java hotspot. But all in all, I think it's really interesting uh, to try it out. And for us, uh, it was really a game changer for lambdas. But just for lambdas, we don't, we, yeah, we don't use it for, for microservices. But for lambdas, as I said, uh, in the previous uh, slide, in the beginning of the presentation, yeah, it's, it's incomparable faster. You, you cannot uh, do better. Uh, all in all, that was it. Thank you so much. And if you have some questions, please ask. If you don't, have, meanwhile, maybe you, you are thinking what you ask. If you are too shy, just contact me uh, uh, in the, in the uh, outside of this room. Uh, here I made the, the slides available. So on my uh, website, yonosbaloshin.com uh, slash talks, you can just click on this. And basically, so you have the full slide deck. And basically here in GitHub, this is also an open project. Oh, it's not this one. But here on GitHub, basically, you have everything which, uh, we, that I told you already. And you can just copy paste all the comments. Maybe uh, if you don't have questions, do you have one question at least? I can ask a question for myself. How would you proceed with Docker? And how would you proceed with these uh, multi-stage pipelines? With Docker, if you want to do it, the best way uh, that I found is to, to have a pre-filled Docker container with the archive inside. So you do basically the, you generate the archive on one environment, you take it from there, you create a base Docker uh, image with that archive inside, and then you start the JVM process referring to the archive from inside the Docker container. Otherwise, it might become a bit tricky. You can also potentially reshare. If you keep it in a, uh, in a shared folder, you can reshare across Docker containers. But I found myself this would be the most optimal way. So do it from one environment. Uh, generate it on one environment, put it in Docker, release that image, and then on a subsequent run, just use it. This would work. But of course, it's not uh, very handy because you need to try a lot of things until you make it. Thank you, Dan, and uh, wish you a lovely uh, end of the conference, and yeah, see you.